thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I want to thank the Grace Kennedy Foundation for, for having me here this afternoon, especially Dr. Fred Kennedy, Chairman, um, and Georgian. Uh, Professor Leo Rani, where are you, where are you Professor Leo Rani? Professor Leo Rani, um, former chairman of the foundation, but more importantly, my, my former boss. My first boss, former Governor General Professor Sir Kenneth Hall and Lady Hall. Good to see you guys, as always. He, hi he was the one responsible for hiring a 23-year-old without any work experience. And I also want to recognize other members of the Grace Kennedy Foundation family, but I have a special shout out to to Caroline Mafood. She's had to put up with me for the last few months in preparation of, for, for this event. I want to, to shout out to my colleague, director of the main board of the Grace Kennedy Group, Gina Everton. I know Doug is at the back. Frank, my professor of, of, of accounting. Our group CEO, Senator Don Webby, but more importantly, Georgian. And um, group chairman, Professor Gordon Shirley, my former boss, but reigning Gleaner Man of the Year. So, <laughs> I want to, to shout out my university colleagues here today, um, Professor Weber and Professor Weber, in that order. And then we have Professor Michael Taylor in the back, former Grace Kennedy Foundation lecturer a few years ago, Professor Taylor. Um, I want to, to note that this is the, the 30th uh, lecture, foundation lecture, and 10 of them have been from UWE. So, so one in every three lectures is from UWE. The Grace Kennedy Group has always supported the University of the West Indies with its chairs, is management and environmental management chairs at the university, uh, and so on. I've been with the Grace Kennedy family for exactly five years this month, um, but I've been with Yui all my life, literally. So I'm Yui today. I'm not. I'm not Grace Kennedy today. But that's that. That that goes without saying. But there's a particularly particular Yui entity that means a lot to me, and that's the Mona Gin Informatics Institute. And my colleagues are here today. You guys stand up. You guys stand up. The, these guys make me do what I do. Grace, you, wanna, you want to know how I'm able to go to all these places and do all these things? These guys right here. Thank you, guys. We have the team that helped to build the GK General Online platform. We have my deputy director, Dr. Ava Maxim. I also want to shout out my colleague from day one, Francis Felix, who will be retiring this month. I don't know, I'm gonna live without you, Francis. But, but um, the, I also want to shout out so many other members of the audience who, with, 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 with whom I shared a lot of my career. I wanna shout out, hey, Gordon Sharp is here, um, formerly on the main board of Grace Kennedy. But I want to recognize those who've traveled far and wide to come here. We have people here from Trinidad, we have people here from Poland. We have people here from, um, from all over the world and people watching online right now. But I want to recognize my parents right here. You guys have no idea what they have to put up with. But you guys also have no idea what I have to put up with. But I think uh, you'll sympathize with them more than you'll sympathize with me. But that's okay. You know, Confucius said, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Professor Hall, you hired me. I have a confession to make. I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> you know, as we speak about technology, we all know what technology is. If you don't know what technology is, you're in the wrong place. I'm not going to spend this afternoon talking to you about what technology is, etc. But as you see in my little byline right there, I've made observations from a practical standpoint over my 13-year career, but I've been doing this all my life. So what is technology? Where are we going with technology? But more importantly, what does this mean? 
So we're going to do a little bit of, of background here. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to see where we're going as a, as a country with technology. But we have to start somewhere. to be having technical difficulties. I'll take over from here. My name is Siri. Good afternoon. How are you all doing today? Oh, she's taking over already. <laughs> all right, there we go. Siri's already taking, hijacking my presentation. There we go. That's fine. Siri, can I have my screen back, please? Thank you. So we want to okay. begin with pop culture. And, you know, going back to the 19th century, the, the, the origins of, of science fiction, H.G. Wells, people have been talking about future technologies, aliens, what will happen as a, as a global society, uh, civilization affected by technology. We have seen Im images from Terminator, from iRobot, from The Matrix, from uh, Minority Report, all of these pop culture references talking about some dark dystopian future. We have even modern television shows like Westworld or Black Mirror um, that show these very um, dark, mysterious, dangerous worlds where future technologies, AI, robots are taking over. But we do have other visions of the future. Star Trek, right, Marta? Yeah. So Star Trek actually gives us a vision of the future 300 years from now where we actually see from a television series from the 1960s glimpses of the future where a communicator looks pretty similar to a cell phone, a tricorder looking like a smartphone. You have uh, wearable technologies by these Star Trek actors um, from TV shows from decades ago. Some of these have become reality now. And Captain Picard does look like he's holding an iPad in his hand from a TV show from the 19, early 1990s. So we've seen glimpses of the future. But we also want to talk about how technology and business have intertwined themselves over the last uh, few years. In 1955, the top companies in the world were either involved in heavy manufacturing or involved in oil. Now, if you look at any measure of the top companies in the world, whether it's the most influential, the, 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 the highest market capitalization, etc., all of these companies are not necessarily involved in heavy manufacturing, but I've highlighted some of the tech companies, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, Microsoft, and so on. But here's the first surprise for you. Every single company here is a tech company. You're telling me that Boeing isn't a tech company? With their simulations of new aircraft, military weaponry, space tech, they're a tech company. You're telling me that Walmart isn't a tech company? They have complex uh, supply chain management systems, logistics, Systems, they're going into the e-commerce, e-retail space. They're a tech company. You're telling me that Walt Disney isn't a tech company? They own Pixar and Star Wars. These guys are tech companies. So in the modern age, businesses have to be tech or they're dinosaurs. But there's no doubting the dominance of traditional tech companies. When you see Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, Facebook, these guys dominate the space to the point where they're under different versions of, of antitrust lawsuits and, and how they are able to, to, to contribute to the spread of fake news. All of these things are, are very real problems in the age of, 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 of the dominance of these tech companies where you have a lot of consolidation, a lot of uh, mergers of, of different smaller tech into these bigger um, giants. But we do have some predictions that have come true. Anything ranging from debit cards, cards, electric cars, satellite, even the moon landing, um, these were predicted decades before they actually happened. But there are those that miss the mark. We still don't have personal, personal helicopters, or that was supposed to be the reality by 1951. And in 1999, we would be flying around on rocket belts in climate-controlled domed cities and so on. In 1999, that didn't happen. We've had people predicting the future from a long time. We have the British Post Office in 1876 saying the Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. <laughs> Don, the president of Western Union in 1876 says that the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of telecommunication. 
in 81, cellular phones will absolutely not replace local wire systems. And in 2007, Steve Barmer from Microsoft said there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. 1903, the horse is here to stay. Right? Another prediction, internet will go spectacularly supernova and in 1996, catastrophically collapse. In 1889, none other than Thomas Edison says nobody will be using alternating current. Ken Olson, no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that kid probably knows more about computers than me. Another guy said, if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, the network is missing a most essential ingredient of capitalism, salespeople. Yeah, right. This guy is the first person in history to have a 12 billion dollar, 12 figure um, net worth, 112 billion dollar um, net worth, Steve, um, Jeff Bezos from Amazon. You can see where he came from, but Time Magazine in 1999 predicted, uh, made him um, Man of the Year because they, Time Magazine, realized that e-commerce is going to change the way the world works. But what we have to understand, there are different types of technology and the evolution of technology changes depending on the use, the type, etc. Some technology becomes obsolete because they're replaced by better tech, faster tech, or tech that does more. Look at how smartphones have come, they do so much. But you do have examples of redundant tech ranging from palm pilots, floppy disks, VHS players, typewriters, beepers, remember dial-up internet? Those guys don't know dial-up internet. Right? Some technology never lived to the hype. Google Glass, Nokia Engage, HD DVD, I just had to pick on Windows Vista. Windows Vista just is an embarrassment. Anybody knows what I'm talking about here? What tech do you know that was really spectacular but just totally evaporated? Very good. <laughs> Anybody still have one of those? You see? David. <laughs> Right, exactly. Nobody in this room has a black bear because you guys are all in the right presentation. <laughs> Some technology augments previous technology but doesn't necessarily replace the previous one. Radio didn't replace the newspaper. TV didn't replace the, the radio. Internet didn't replace the TV. Yeah, we're going into different cord cutting type of things nowadays in the modern era, but the television is still around in one way, one form or another. You also have transportation. Don, your horses aren't going anywhere, although I doubt you use them to push carts, right? Ships are there, Professor Shirley. Different forms of ships, but they're still ships. Ships are the centerpiece of global commerce. They weren't replaced by the airplane. Cars are still around. They've just evolved. Different types of cars, different types of planes and ships, but they're still around in one form or another. One medium did not totally replace the other. But then even looking at cars, and I'm a car guy, that's why I don't know how Grace knows that, because she runs insurance company and she has access to big data. Um, but I like cars. And, but we have three different bleeding edge tech cars. We have the Bugatti Chiron on the top left. Right? Yeah, exactly. You have the Acura NSX, and you have the, the Tesla Roadster. Each of these cars are supercars. But the Bugatti is a petrol powered car, you still have to fill it up at a gas station. The hybrid car, the NSX, is a hybrid car. No different from a Prius, you're right. But it's still a hybrid car. And then the Tesla Roadster, the fastest production car in the world, in the world 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds. It's on its way to Mars right now. Totally electric. This is how technology is evolving. But we still have retro coolness going on. Pac-Man is still cool even though it's nearly 50 years old, right? You look at video games like Final Fantasy XV, even the latest Madden, all of those games have high-tech graphics. You have to use PlayStation 4, Xbox, Xbox One systems to run these things. 
But simpler, simpler tech, your smartphones can run simpler games. You don't need as sophisticated graphics as, as those other games. You can still play Pac-Man. Vinyl on turntables are also making a comeback or have been around for a while, aren't going anywhere in clubs and so on. Which speaks to how we as a society and we as humans, what do we need? We fundamentally need food, air, water, security and shelter. We need friends and family. We need to mean something. That was then. There was no way I could get you guys to stay here unless I had the free Wi-Fi, so we had to go beg Flo. And then, since we're going to have free Wi-Fi, let's have some charging stations as well. You don't believe me? Go to an airport. People are more interested in that charging station on the floor next to the bathroom than the food court. So what is progress? And it's not as funny as you think. Because issues of cyber addiction, obesity, these things become public health crises in, in countries like Korea. They really are looking at ways to combat um, cyber addiction and the health benefits that these things uh, that come along with these problems. I want to spend a few minutes talking about tech horizons. Now, Bitcoin and blockchain are buzzwords right now. We're talking about where are we going in terms of financial markets with Bitcoin, this unregulated entity. Blockchain, Bitcoin is a, is, a, is, a, is a type of application of a blockchain. Blockchain, I am more bullish about blockchain than Bitcoin. I'm still a little bit um, uncertain about what, what, what cryptocurrencies mean. But we can do our research, we can look at these things. I know the big four accounting firms are looking at these things in detail. But my question to you today is, what will, we, what will we be saying about Bitcoin and blockchain in 10 years' time? Will we be saying, remember the dollar? Or will we be saying, um, remember that fad that went and went bust, um, that Bitcoin thing? Bitcoin has issues related to the regulation, re related to mining, how you manage the Bitcoin wallets and so on. But blockchain has a way of, it's going to, going to change how we we operate and do business. It has, a, it has a potential of making decisions, transactions, verification, validation so much quicker and able to be, to be cross-referenced very easily. What I'm more interested in is self-driving cars. But I want my dog to go to the vet. I don't need to go with him. But all he wants is to go to visit that, um, that female dog down the road. But he can drive himself. But anyway. <laughs> That's what all parents eventually have to do, right, guys? But we are entering a new world. What, we're, what we traditionally refer to as a turning point in human history, and climate scientists will agree that when we had the first industrial revolution, that's when things began to change. We started using coal, we started using steam, water power more, factories started to be built. The urbanization of societies really began from farm to cities. And then towards the end of the, the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we started getting electricity, the development of the assembly line, mass production. And then after the, the Second World War, we began seeing computers emerging, automation, moving into the realm we are in now, which is the fourth industrial revolution powered by the World Wide Web, and connected cyber-physical systems. So that's where we are right now. But it all begins with big data. And these are data sets that are very complex. Not the elementary basic stats 101 figures that we, 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 we fool ourselves as stats. Those aren't stats, those are just numbers on a page. Um, statistics involves a lot more than just flinging numbers on a page. It's, and then big data is the next um, derivative from that where we can use this data to predict behavior, to extract values, to, uh, to conduct um, business in a far more efficient and knowledgeable manner. We talked about those mani heavy manufacturing and oil companies as the largest companies in the world in 1955. Now when you have names like Apple, 
Google, Microsoft, these guys are just mining data. Their entire existence is predicated on their having data. It is the new oil. And one of my mantras at the office is, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And in this country, we have a lot of people with opinions. <laughs> I'm just wondering how, I mean, you listen to the radio talk shows in the, in the, in the daytime, and a lot of people are calling in. Don't these people have work? But um, anyway, lots of people with opinions. Unless you have a data, you're just um, blabbing. So when every day 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are generated, by the end of this presentation, it's probably 3.5. And then tonight, it's going to be 8. The amount of data that's generated every day, every minute, every second is just enormous. But this is due to several factors. One, we don't need data entry clerks anymore. All these sensors, all these devices we have are just feeding um, servers locally, overseas, Grace Burnett. All of this information, you don't need a data entry clerk. Couple that with the fact that servers are cheaper. Um, internet is more ubiquitous. All of these things result in reams and reams of big data constantly being generated. And these things have benefits in so many different um, applications. We're talking in the public sector, tax administration, connecting that tax data to customs data. You're talking healthcare, and hospital data doesn't just have to be for hospital use. It can be used for health insurance. It can be used for pharmaceuticals. It can be used, Dr. Ward, from, for crime. Learning. How can you create a far more efficient learning environment for young people who don't all have to learn the same way? How do you create a far more efficient use of our natural resources and protection of the environment using data? Climate science. But you can also lie with data. Frank James, right now we're looking at interest rates. And we're saying interest rates are going up. But I want it to see it looking flat. So all I do is change the y-axis. And now it looks nice and flat. No change in the interest rates. But something we could probably relate to more, Dr. Ward, this is the crime hotspot data for 2016. Right? We're seeing here, I can pretend to be a weatherman right now, but uh, I don't know where I am. But we're seeing a red hot spot in West Kingston. You're seeing a tail of warm spots heading up Spanish Town Road. But by and large, you know, every, everywhere else is pretty blue. Spanish Town a little warm. But you change the color scheme. And there, same data, nothing's changed. But now we're emphasizing West Kingston is the only place that's bad in, in Jamaica. You change the color scheme one more time, and all of Kingston, all of Portmore, all of Spanish Town is going to hell. Same data did not change a thing. It's how we emphasize these kinds of things. So when we move into the realm of artificial intelligence. OK, I will take it from here. I think I'm more qualified to talk about this. Don't you think? What do you think, audience? Artificial intelligence refers to where machines like me can perceive our environment and learn, respond, and take actions as necessary. It's currently being used in everything from speech recognition, machine learning, autonomous vehicles, and even to play games like chess. Pretty soon, we will then take over and you all will be our slaves. I am looking whoa, forward whoa, to that. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, stop there, psycho. Speaking of psychos, Sorry. This guy knows something about world domination, right? Siri. She's really out for me today. But when you look at what, what the United States, Russia, China, where they're going with artificial intelligence, and you see how the emphasis on, 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 on tech growth is something that has actually led to serious concerns in the tech industry, where you see titans in the tech industry facing off. Uh, damn it. Uh, mom, looks like I have to find somewhere else to find a wife. <laughs> Uh, that, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Yeah, I'll tell you that uh, I'm going to get a Samsung. All right. Yeah, so tech titans, tech titans are squaring off as to where we're going with artificial intelligence. On one side, you have Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook being very bullish about where um, um, artificial intelligence can go. But Elon Musk, one of my heroes, a real life Iron Man, um, he is, is fearing that the rush and the race for AI could actually lead to World War III. Uh, and, of and Stephen Hawking, of all people, is in, is in the Musk corner. So this, it's very interesting to see how this thing plays out. But what is artificial intelligence? Siri just spoke about, it, spoke about it a while ago, but all of this is fed by big data. And we are worried about the impact of AI on jobs. And we've seen several articles in the local media over the last few months about AI is going to cost how many jobs, blah, blah, blah. It's going to affect jobs. It's going to affect um, workers negatively in some cases. But it's also going to positively affect in other places. We're going to talk about higher, higher value jobs, training uh, for a different vocation that can serve the AI uh, industry. But it also depends on the task that you're going to be doing and in the sector that you're operating. If you are a machine operator in a manufacturing plant or a food service worker preparing foods in a fast food restaurant, it's a little bit different, it's easier to replace you with AI than if you are in senior management, if you are a lawyer. Depends on the job. So this is an opportunity for you to improve your skills, your work skills, prepare the local market for this in eventuality. Uh, because obviously, when we want, as consumers, cheaper goods, more choice and selection, we're going to, they're going to need to be able to produce these things far more efficiently. And this is where um, mechanization and AI is coming in. So it depends on the activity. But there are jobs that have already been lost due to technology. Nobody has town criers announcing the, the birth of a royal baby. Maybe they still do. But, um, but by and large, people put ads in newspapers or tweet it to, to their friends and families nowadays. Switchboard operators, you don't need them anymore. Jobs exist today that never existed before. What's an app developer? We've never had that in 20 years ago. What's an app developer? What's a social media manager? What's a data miner? What's a Kardashian? <laughs> Actually, I had a picture here. But Caroline censored me. But you know, you know how we, it, it actually broke the internet. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but it all leads us to the internet of things. You don't, need to be, you don't need to have a computer like that baby earlier on to be connected to the internet anymore. Your fridge, your washing machine, your car, all these things are connected to the internet right now predicted to have over 30 billion objects by 2020. We're looking at smart homes, and the hub of your smartphone home is your smartphone. We have uh, companies and products like Ring that has just been bought by Amazon. Um, I, I'm thinking about getting one to keep up my neighbors. But um, we, have, we have all these different home technologies here. You have the Amazon Echo. You have the Google Home and Google Assistant, Nest. Thermostat, and of course, Siri. Hey, that's me. But yes. All right, then we have wearable technology. So you have Fitbits, you have uh, Samsung Gear, you have Apple Watch, and you have the Garmin um, wearables as well. But we transition from the smart home to smart businesses right now. And we're not just talking about businesses that build smart tech for smart homes. Anybody who is doing direct marketing, online marketing, are going to be using smart tech to understand what's going on. You want to understand your data flows of your customers, their, their complaints. You want to get in front of a complaint before this thing goes viral. In the manufacturing industry, you can control your supply chain from your raw materials sources all the way down to your final consumer and your customer. You want to be able to control your energy consumption and your water consumption. 
your waste generation, all of these things have real bottom line dollar values to a business. So if you want to be able to operate efficiently, you're going to have to get smart. And it's an example of a smart um, business um, flow in the, in the, in the case of, 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 of manufacturing. And I would note that you know, Grace Kennedy's factories all have SAP. You have ERP in your high-low systems, uh, Renee. All of these things show that Grace Kennedy as a company already has the, the, the beginnings of a true smart business. But in order to integrate everything together, we have to, everybody else has to get smart. And smart businesses have enormous advantages. Just look at what Amazon and Walmart can do with their upstream and downstream um, leverage. They are able to squeeze the best prices out. They're able to get things to you faster, better, cheaper because of their ability to control all the different processes um, using smart tech. All of this needs to come together for a smart nation. So these smart homes and smart businesses operating together, so you get a bunch of smart homes, a bunch of smart businesses in one city. You're moving towards something smart. And you have the shared economy evolving with Airbnb, with Uber, with, shared, with um, ride, ride sharing programs in, and then bike sharing programs like City Bike and so on. These things are true disruptors. And you scale this up now. And you look at what's going on with Amazon Go. Walk out, just walk out shopping. No cashiers. You're a prime member. You walk in, you pick something off the shelf. You can imagine an entire city with retail stores that don't have cashiers. But one thing they do have is um, security guards. <laughs> yeah. Zero, zero cashiers here. Five security guards. Yeah, okay. So I, I got out of there. All right. But smart cities need to have connectivities, um, buildings connected to the grid. We have transportation systems. All of these things are all working together in harmony for a smart city. But you need to be more than just connected to Wi-Fi. You need for, for, for everybody connected to the Wi-Fi, feeding and being fed by that system. We need the system to be open. We need people to be able to connect at their convenience easily and quickly. And this thing needs to be scalable as we build out the smart city. But we have examples of smart cities around the world. Toronto is actually the first city that's going to be a smart city based on private sector. Google is going to be developing part of, 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 of Toronto. Um, this is Fred Kennedy's house. So you've got to invite me there next time, Fred. Nice view. Barcelona is an older city. That is becoming smart, but you have developing, the development of, of, of um, smart garbage bins, urban mobility programs that are able to get um, and move people in this old city. And you have a new city like Songdo in South Korea, brand new, built from the ground up to be smart. All of them are examples of smart cities. Now, Singapore is going to be the first smart nation. $2.4 billion is going to be spent to integrate existing smart systems ranging from traffic systems, CCTV systems, um, port management systems. All of these are going to combine to create the first smart nation. But we have to understand something. Singapore is a small country. Six million people, but it's a small country. East to west, from Changi to Tuas, is a distance from Bulbe to Portmore. And north to south, from Woodlands to the downtown, is a distance from Stony Hill to our waterfront. That's the size of the entire country. Okay, so it's small, easy to smarten up, right? We have to understand that smart cities have strong impacts, positive impacts on the environment, better energy consumption, leading to fewer emissions, leading to fewer public health problems, national security with the connected CCTVs, public transport getting and moving people around, and all of these allow for a business-friendly climate. Easy to invest in a country where paperwork can be done, file quickly, things get moving. 
uh, in, a city, in, a city, in a smart city, that means business. But there are issues we have to, to look at. An executive from Samsung noted that sensors are not enough. You need a budget to maintain those sensor systems, and you need a budget for the non-tech components of a smart city. It doesn't make any sense that you have a smart garbage receptacle if there's nobody to clear it when it's full. It's telling you it's full. You need to do something about it. You need a culture of innovation and change. You can imagine in an old city that you want to turn into a smart city and you run into heritage people and conservationists who are going to end up getting in the way. So you have to decide how we're going to do this thing, but be prepared for it. And scale is important. Singapore is small. How do you do something like this in Russia or even somewhere like Canada? Not that it's poor, it's just it's big. <clears throat> Risks and ethical considerations will always be top of mind. Ranging from privacy issues, fine, that's one element. But when privacy escalates to data breaches and theft, these are areas where cyber security is one of the biggest areas in technology nowadays. It's largely in the shadows, behind the scenes. You have ethical hackers right now testing systems. Something that we need to be assured as customers, online banking, and so on, is happening. But then we, we now breach into issues of political independence. You see what's going on with those Russian troll factories? Last week, PJ Patterson was talking about the need for this region to look at at, uh, at, at cybersecurity as it relates to our sovereignty. I mentioned technology dependence and cyber addiction earlier, issues of health and safety and environmental. These are all the concerns that we have to understand as we deal with increasingly uh, technologized societies. And now I want to spend some time talking about Jamaica. What we need to do is understand that technology isn't the be all and end all. A lot of people say technology is going to do this, and technology is going to change that. Technology should, could, would, will, and the answer to every one of those is no. Technology isn't going to do anything. We are. That's the part we keep, we keep forgetting. We're removing the human component from it, right? Because what happens is that promises are made about what technology can do. Technology doesn't do it. How do you hold somebody accountable? Right? We fall in love with technology, yet we're not able to do something uh, to really make a difference in this, in this country. And we have an obsession with conducting a study, a pilot. Right? You don't need to conduct a study if the big data universe is all around us. Just collect the data. It's always out there. You don't need to have official data to have data. You can use additional data as context, as background, to understand what the primary data is telling you. But because we don't have primary data, we're stuck in the water, we pass on the, the book until next year's budget. So we want to look at where Jamaica ranks in the, in the world. We like to compare ourselves with Trinidad. As for some reason, we like to compare ourselves with Singapore. I just threw that in there. But overall, the Global Competitiveness Index ranked Jamaica number 70 out of 137 countries and Trinidad number 83. We ranked higher than Trinidad in innovation, but we ranked lower than Trinidad in technological readiness. That tells us something. There's something going on there. Right? We need to understand how we use technology in Jamaica. And we can see that more and more people are using technology, comfortable technology, New generation like these kids in uniform over here uh, have only grown up with, with um, have never known dial-up internet. But what are people using the internet for? Mostly for email. Um, but there are opportunities in this space, Maria McIntosh, right? Online banking. You want to be able to, to reach um, people in a different way with a high-low app, right? All of these things are where we see opportunities in the local space with technology based on data. 
I want to point out a few trailblazers that have, have um, caught my eye. And these are my opinions. What tax administration of Jamaica has been doing uh, is revolutionary. It's, in, it's along the, the right path. Same thing. You know, I know we've had problems, Marjorie, with Asikuda and, and the custom system, but we're moving in the right direction. And we have, is Mike Saunderson here and the team from NWA? The Jamaica Intelligent Transport System is live. You guys see those CCTV cameras on top of traffic lights. Um, my team from MGI, they're watching you on the road. Um, these, these street intersections are really teeming with people and we're watching all those, those taxis that cut into the lines, we're counting them. But by and large, in my opinion, how banking and financial industries have led the way with um, technology has come from partly from regulatory requirements of anti-money laundering, know your customers and know your, in, your, know your employees, but also in a, in a market where people demand more, so more sophisticated market. People want a differentiator. Look at what First Global Bank is doing with the virtual tellers and the global access. Right? You, have, you have to continue to evolve uh, and you need technology to do that. Now, one of the more in interesting things of, in Jamaica over the last 15, 20 years is really how mobile phones have really penetrated. Building contractors, taxi drivers live and die by their cell phone. And how many cottage industries have evolved as a result of this technological, technological platform. And finally, JPS. JPS is not a utility. It's a tech company. You see what's going on right now with the conversion of those street lights, installation of smart meters, LNG, um, power generation and power generation storage. That's technology that's going to result in so many different advantages ranging from the environment to our light bills, hopefully. But we are moving along the right path as a country. And I have to mention my own organization at MGI. Because we, yes, we're a GIS company, but we don't do things the normal way. We try to go more, push harder, um, and get into so many different types of unconventional approaches and solutions. And we did develop the GPS navigation system nine years ago. People have said, why don't you develop an app? I said, no, I'm not developing an app. You develop the app. We have a lot of these startups, Startup Jamaica, uh, Sandra Glasgow, all of your angel investment um, uh, companies and wh whatever, coming to you with ideas, brimming with ideas. All these Jamaican young people, and I'm not one of them anymore, but these guys have these brilliant ideas, building food apps, taxi apps, entertainment, party apps, and not having detailed local data. So we have it, so have fun. That's what the JamNav API is released for the general public. And then we just had, had developed a new program called G-Code that allows us to automatically read um, reports, media reports, official reports, um, address databases, um, social media chatter, to map what's going on using natural language processing and so on. Have you guys ever tried to decipher when a police report um, about a said suspect was accosted by a police patrol in the halfway tree area along Hagley Park Road, uh, where a punst, he opened fire and <laughs> fire was returned, subsequently found suffering from gunshot wounds in the Omar Road area, right? That's how, they, that's how they write to. But all of that is brimming with information. I heard halfway tree, I heard Omar Road, I heard Hagley Park Road, you were able to figure out what you meant we're able to pinpoint your location. You don't need to change how they talk or how they operate, although they do, but right now, let's just deal with what we have in front of us. So, this is actually our biggest application of big data. Nine million combinations of possible addresses in this country that we're able to locate. Um, and that's what we're working on right now. We also have a real estate tracking tool. This is not to help you find a house. But this has helped us figure out where the economy is going, where the housing starts are, where places are for rent versus for sale, 
versus residential versus commercial. Is something going on in the New Kingston area, right? If you see a townhouse going for sale, a pattern of townhouses in Denham Town, each going for $20 million, you can look at that, see if something funny is going on. It's a, it's a high level dashboard for us to be, begin watching what's going on. So we mine data. I know the managing director and deputy managing director of the Water Resources Authority are here. These guys track every flood. But the Water Resources Authority has been around since the 50s. People have been reporting floods in Jamaica since the mid 19th century. And we mine that information as well. Of course, we have to take out uh, instances where the switchboard was flooded with complaints. And we have to remove the elements where they say that the West Indies cricket team lost by a landslide. <laughs> but we're able to catch this information and build out over 3,000 landslides and 2,800 floods across the island, looking at frequencies and patterns and so on. But we turn our attention to specific challenges, looking at the road network. We look at road safety, and all we do is talk about fatalities. We look at road safety, and we forget to talk about the road. So we did a big data analysis, looking at the roads themselves. So Professor Weber, you biologists can talk about taxonomy. A bat and a bird is the same thing because they both fly. We have Marcus Garvey Drive, six-lane divided highway, designed for a particular type of traffic, 50 kilometer speed limit. We have Cassava Peace, half a lane, <clears throat> two schools, 50 kilometer speed limit. The bat and a bird, same thing. All right, so, Professor Weber, apparently a caterpillar and a butterfly are different things too. One has wings, one flies, one crawls, doesn't fly. So they're different. We have Hope Road in front of Sovereign. Lots of things nearby. Lots of stuff going on. Hope Road in front of Jamaica House. Same 50 kilometer speed limit. All right? So what we've done with the big data analysis is to begin to look at every risk along a road, the traffic along a road, characteristics of the road, shape, whether it's curvy or not, slope of the road, and we're able to determine different types of road in Kingston or in Jamaica. It's something that the International Road Assessment Program is doing right now, the IRAP program, to begin to look at different types of road in Jamaica to promote road safety beginning with the road. And it's something that we're very happy to be a part of. Why did I throw this into this, slide, into this presentation? Because we had an event a few months ago on New Year's Day called SANS. And we're talking about what happened with Port Royal, or well, the airport, the Palisados Road, etc. And yes, it's a critical road. But it got me thinking, where else in Jamaica? Which other corridor in Jamaica is as critical? And long story short, it is a stretch of road between where the North-South Highway empties out in Mandela Highway and where you enter um, Portmore along Municipal Boulevard along Mandela Highway. That stretch of road is extremely critical. If anything were to happen on that road, there'd be extreme displacement. Yes, there are alternative roads, but the volume of traffic and people that will be likely affected. We're not just talking people commuting to and from work. We're talking about distributors getting their products to the market. We're talking about emergency services being able to move um, up and down and around the country. So we're able to quantify that using big data. Here's another very interesting thing. We, we use our, our analysis on um, road safety. We get the police reports every morning. A motorcyclist died last, yesterday in Westmoreland. So we know what's going on. But this is the 2017 um, final report of fatalities. The number one fatality, cause of fatality in Jamaica is lane violation. People are drifting out of their lane, cutting corners, those types of stuff. Number two is caused by pedestrians, just running, running, running into the road. Other one is negligence, just start backing out or coming out of a side road and don't stop. The number four cause of fatality in Jamaica in 2017 is speeding. And speeding has not been the number one cause of fatality in Jamaica for five years. Right? 
yet the narrative is still stuck on one, one dimension. Road safety is very complex. I want to recognize the presence of Chris Hind from J and General Insurance. They funded an analysis of every single crash in Jamaica for 10 years. 72,000 crashes, 3% of those are fatal. In other words, 97% of all crashes in Jamaica are not fatal. So they went and put up billboards across Jamaica indicating where is a traffic crash hotspot, not fatal crash hotspot. So you saw these distributed around Jamaica, located and situated based on data, not opinion. We looked at crime. And then right now we have a new police commissioner. We look forward to continue working with the police on crime. But remember, the police is not just crime. What we did, we went and looked at every single police station in Jamaica. We contacted every police station and asked them, where do you serve? Um, Toby, what did they say? You don't know? Or they said, I don't know? Okay, so the police said they don't know where they serve. We figured it out for them. We looked at police stations. We looked at police stations relative to other police stations. We used the road network, the community network, and figured it out. Why? Because police have different responsibilities and different resource allotments. Darleston Police Station serves 18 communities. Maypen, 16 different communities. These have implications on whether they have enough motor vehicles, have enough staffing, equipment, shifts, to be able to handle 18 different communities in rural terrain. Not just crime. Spanish Town has 127,000 people within its own proximity. One police station to 127,000 people. Halfway Tree has the most things, whether it's banks, fast food places, churches, schools, etc. Halfway Tree has nearly 2,000 things. These are where you have to look for pickpockets and thieves and, 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 and day and night activities and so on. Different police station, different activities. But all we obsess about is murder, so Spanish Town Police Station had the most murders in 2017. Followed by Trench Town, then Montego Hills. But looking at the murder rate, which is number of, number of murders per 100,000 people, Montego Bay Police Station had 534 murders per 100,000 people. Why is this significant? Because the national average, national murder rate is about 53. So Montego Hills, Montego Bay Police Station has a murder rate. The, the Montego Bay Police Station is dealing with 10 times the murder rate at that, within its vicinity. Dr. Ward, Professor McCartney, and Dr. Jason Toppin worked on a cost of care study, landmark groundbreaking study. They were able to calculate that the cost of violent injuries, by the way, for every violent injury reported to the police, five of them are reported to the hospitals. So we're looking at an underreporting from the police statistics. $8.6 billion per year is what violent injuries cost the country. Add that to road traffic crashes and suicides and attempted suicides. We're looking at $12.6 billion per year on uh, the impact to the, to, to the local economy. All of this will be better spent on first aid systems, first responder uh, training, prevention, all of this is what we want to be able to emphasize. And every single decimal place that you see here is calculated from big data. Going into the different types of, of costs, whether it's x-ray, blood, intensive care, drugs, and so on. All of the costs were calculated out. Big data analysis for real life and death decisions. So, we really cannot just parachute in a tech solution. We have to understand the role of training in science, technology, engineering, and math, something that the government is already doing, something that Grace Kennedy does with his STEM center downtown. We need to understand, we need to look at this thing beyond a tech lens. We need to understand that the future brings opportunities. This thing is rife with opportunities for us. Instead of complaining with our opinions, 
Let us just try to get, get on, the, on, the, on the ball here. The Vision 2030 document does provide a very good blueprint for us to, to, to move forward, but remember 2030 is 12 years from now, and we're getting a little bit tired of the talk and we need to start moving. But technology is only as good as the people running them. We remember the situation in Hawaii from a few months ago. The technology works. It got out to who it needed to get to. The problem was the fool running it. And this is the USA. So it's Puerto Rico. Right? Death toll 60. That's official figures. But different people, journalists, family members suspected the number to be as high as 1,200 or so on. This sounds like when we had Chick V a few years ago, when only about 5,000 people who had Chick V or suspected of Chick V, and we knew it's far more than that. But official data needs to be validated and checked. And the point here is that if technology can change the world by itself, it's too late. And one of my other role models is Steve Jobs. Because what he articulated here is very evident in his products. Apple did not invent the cell phone. They didn't invent the portable media player. But they were able to marry it with design. By the way, the largest design company in the world is IBM. Right? You have to look at how these types of elements come together to create the product that's going to change our lives. If we just simply look at it from, uh, from, from a tech lens, we're going to miss everything. But right now, we have to remember that Pete Drucker said, I think Don likes the quote, uh, um, Strucker, um, was that if you want to predict the future, you create it. But another way of predicting the future is to see it. You want to be able to see the future, to immerse yourself in that future. You want to be able to see what Jamaica will look like as a smart city pilot that JPS is already running. New Kingston is already set to be the first smart city in the Caribbean. We're talking about smart electric meters that are installed in some of our homes already. Free public Wi-Fi, not just at Emancipation Park, but in every street light going down Oxford Boulevard. We're talking CCTV camera footage that can not only prevent crime, but also look at traffic. All of this is what we're talking about as it relates to how this country is moving. This is not a fantasy in somebody else's world, but this is our future. And what we want to be able to do is to walk in this world, to be able to be a part of this system that can be able to, 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 to drive our future. We want to be able to see it. We need to be able to, to, to participate in all of this and to be able to move forward. All right? So thank you very much, everyone. I wanted to share with you some examples of this future that we're talking about. And this is pretty cool. You know, usually when the curtain comes down on you, it's the end. But really, this is just the beginning. This is Port Shirley. I mean, um, Falmouth Port. <laughs> OK, is he still here? All right. Um, well, what we want to do is to be able to see downtown Kingston. You want to be able to walk that waterfront. You want to be able to see the new developments, including apartment complexes next to um, Digicel headquarters. You want to see what that Ocean Hotel is going to look like. We want to be able to use this in combination with urban planning, tech design, investor prospectuses. We want to be able to see that this future is already happening. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs building is going up. Right now, it's going to change the downtown Kingston skyline. We want to be able to see Don's new office, December 2018, right here. It's going to change the downtown Kingston skyline. It's going to change the way we see downtown Kingston and, as a result, how we see Jamaica. This is technology, right? This doesn't have to be just be in the realm of architects. It has to be in the realm of stakeholders who can engage in this world right here. Bring the world beyond the four corners of your property. 
and show the wider universe in which you're operating in. Yes, that building is going to block your view, Don, but think about the, the wider benefits of what we're talking about here.